It may seem obvious that there are a multitude of cultural differences between societies in the world. After all, we can easily see that people vary from one society to the next. It's natural to think that a young woman from a village in rural Kenya in Eastern Africa would have a different view of the world from a young woman from urban Mumbai, India, one of the most populated cities in the world. Additionally, each culture has its own internal variations. Sometimes the differences between cultures are not as large as the differences within cultures. Sociologist Pierre Bourdieu wrote about cultural capital, which consists of material goods, non-material attitudes, and knowledge that are specific to a certain economic class. Bourdieu grouped cultural capital into three categories, embodied, a regional dialect, objectified, possessions, and institutionalized, academic credentials. In the US, some group culture into three categories as well, high, low, and pop, for popular. High, low, and popular culture. Can you identify the chief financial officer of three major corporations? How about the name of the server at three local hangouts? How many books do you own? How many social media sites do you visit? Is your family listed on the social register copyright? Have you ever heard of the social register copyright? In each pair, one type of knowledge is considered high culture and the other low culture. This could be considered stereotyping by economic class rather than by race or gender but sociologists use the term high culture to describe the pattern of cultural experiences and attitudes that exist in the highest or elite class segments of a society. People often associate high culture with intellectualism, political power, and prestige. In America, high culture also tends to be associated with wealth. Events considered high culture can be expensive, formal, and exclusive. Attending a ballet, seeing a play, listening to a live symphony performance, or attending a prestigious university. Similarly, low culture is associated with the pattern of cultural experiences and attitudes that exist in the lowest class segments of a society. The term popular culture refers to the pattern of cultural experiences and attitudes that exist in mainstream society. Popular culture events might include a parade, a baseball game, or the season finale of a television show. Music, anime, and cosplay are pieces of popular culture. Popular culture is accessible by most and is expressed and spread via commercial and social media outlets such as radio, television, movies, the music industry, publishers, and corporate-run websites. You can share a discussion of favorite football teams with a new coworker or comment on a reality show when making small talk in line at the grocery store. But if you try to launch into a deep discussion on the classical Greek play Antigone, Few members of U.S. society today would be familiar with it. Although high culture may be considered by some as superior to popular culture, the lines between high culture and popular culture vary over time and place. Shakespearean plays, considered to be popular culture when they were written, are now part of our society's high culture. 500 years from now, will our descendants consider Dancing with the Stars as fine performance art? Subculture and Counterculture a subculture is just what it sounds like, a smaller cultural group within a larger culture. People of a subculture are part of the larger culture but also share a specific identity within a smaller group. Thousands of subcultures exist within the U.S. ethnic and racial groups share the language, food, and customs of their heritage. Other subcultures are formed through shared experiences. Biker culture revolves around an interest in motorcycles. Some subcultures are formed by people who possess traits or preferences that differ from the majority of a society's population. The body modification community embraces aesthetic additions to the human body, such as tattoos, piercings, and certain forms of plastic surgery. But even as members of a subculture band together, they still identify with and participate in the larger society. Sociologists distinguish subcultures from countercultures, which rejects some of the larger culture's norms and values. In contrast to subcultures, which operate relatively smoothly within the larger society, countercultures might actively defy larger society by developing their own set of rules and norms to live by, sometimes even creating communities that operate outside of greater society. Counterculture members are against the dominant ruling culture and want to install their own values. Subculture members may want to change some things but established procedures are followed. Cults, a word derived from culture, are also considered counterculture groups. 
The group, Yearning for Zion YFZ, in El Dorado, Texas, existed outside the mainstream and the limelight, until its leader was accused of statutory rape and underage marriage. The sect's formal norms clashed too severely to be tolerated by U.S. law, and in 2008, authorities raided the compound and removed more than 200 women and children from the property. Many cults claim to be spiritual, often establishing themselves as a religion. When each of the three Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, in the world began, they were treated as cults and suffered much oppression because of it. Cultural change. Cultures continually change because new items are added to material culture every day and in turn, meanings are assigned to them, non-material, which affects other cultural components. For example, a new technology, such as railroads or smartphones, might introduce new ways of traveling or communicating. New ideas, such as flash mobs or crowdfunding, enter a culture. Sociologists identify two broad categories of change as innovation, meaning new, and diffusion, to spread out. Material cultural change happens when new items are discovered or invented or enter a culture as a result of globalization. Innovation, discovery and invention. An innovation refers to an object or concept's initial appearance in society, it is innovative because it is new. Innovations are discovered or invented. Discoveries make known previously unknown but existing aspects of reality. In 1610, when Galileo looked through his telescope and discovered Saturn, the planet was already there, but until then, no one had known about it. When Christopher Columbus encountered Hispaniola, the island was, of course, already well known to its inhabitants. However, his discovery was new knowledge for Europeans, and it opened the way to changes in European culture, as well as to the cultures of the discovered lands. For example, new foods such as potatoes and tomatoes transformed the European diet, and horses brought from Europe changed hunting practices of Great Plains Native Americans. Inventions result when something new is formed from existing objects or concepts, when things are put together in an entirely new manner. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, electric appliances were invented at an astonishing pace. Cars, airplanes, vacuum cleaners, lamps, radios, telephones, and televisions were all new inventions. Inventions may shape a culture by replacing older ways of carrying out tasks, being integrated into current practices, or creating new activities. Their adoption reflects, and may shape, cultural values, and their use may introduce new norms and practices. Consider the rise of mobile phones. As more and more people began carrying these devices, phone conversations no longer were restricted to homes, offices, and phone booths. People on trains, in restaurants, and in other public places became annoyed by listening to one-sided conversations. New norms and behaviors were needed for cell phone use. Some people pushed for the idea that those who are out in the world should pay attention to their companions and surroundings. Fortunately, technology found a workaround. Texting, which enables quiet communication surpassed phone conversations as the primary way to communicate anywhere, everywhere. When the pace of innovation increases, it can lead to generation gaps. Technological gadgets that catch on quickly with one generation are sometimes dismissed by an older generation that is skeptical or struggles to adopt them. The older generation might tune into a musician performing on public television while the younger generation prefers a live stream. A culture's objects and ideas can cause not just generational but cultural gaps. Material culture tends to diffuse more quickly than non-material culture. Technology can spread through society in a matter of months but it can take generations for the ideas and beliefs of society to change including methods for researching or learning information, e.g., library versus internet search. Figure 3.9 Technology Adoption Life Cycle Sociologist Everett Rogers, 1962, developed a model of the diffusion of innovations. As consumers gradually adopt a new innovation, the item grows toward 100% usage, or complete saturation within a society. This graph is frequently used in business, sales, technology, and cultural innovations. It can be used to describe how quickly different groups adopt or begin using a new technology or a new slang word, but note it is just a framework. Not every innovation follows this exact pattern, but it provides a good foundation for discussion and prediction. Graph Attribution 
copyright Rice University, OpenStax, under CC by 4.0 license. Coined by sociologist William F. Ogburn, 1957, the term culture lag refers to the time that passes between the introduction of a new item of material culture and its social acceptance. Culture lag can also cause tangible problems. The infrastructure of the U.S., built a hundred years ago or more, is having trouble supporting today's more heavily populated and fast-paced life. Yet there is a lag in conceptualizing solutions to infrastructure problems. Municipalities struggle with traffic control, increased air pollution, and limited parking, which are all symptoms of culture lag. Although people are becoming aware of the consequences, overuse, or lack of resources, addressing these needs takes time. Diffusion and globalization. Another way material and non-material culture crosses borders is through diffusion. Like a gas in a laboratory experiment, the item or idea spreads throughout. Diffusion relates to the process of the integration of cultures into the mainstream while globalization refers to the promotion and increase of interactions between different regions and populations around the globe resulting in the integration of markets and interdependence of nations fostered through trade. Ideas concepts, or artifacts are often diffused, or spread, to individuals and groups, resulting in new social practices. People might develop a new appreciation of Thai noodles or Italian gelato, ice cream, Access to television and the internet has brought the lifestyles and values portrayed in U.S. sitcoms into homes around the globe and vice versa. Twitter feeds from public demonstrations in one nation have encouraged political protesters in other countries. When this kind of diffusion occurs, ideas from one culture are introduced into another, often before the associated material objects. The graph above displays when diffusion typically occurs, essentially driving an innovation to spread beyond its earliest adopters to the wider majority of people. American anthropologist Ralph Linton wrote the following essay, which appeared in the American Mercury in 1937. Published half a decade before, globalization became a buzzword. It humorously illustrates how everyday routine in modern America is the sum of years of global human ingenuity. 100% American. There can be no question about the average American's Americanism or his desire to preserve this precarious heritage at all costs. Nevertheless, some insidious foreign ideas have already wormed their way into this civilization without his realizing what was going on. This dawn finds the unsuspecting patriot garbed in pajamas, a garment of Indian origin, and lying in a bed built on a pattern that originated in either Persia or Asia Minor. He is muffled to the ears in un-American materials cotton, first domesticated in India, lined, domesticated in the Near East, wool, from an animal native to Asia Minor, or silk whose uses were first discovered by the Chinese. All these substances have been transformed into clothes by methods invented in southwestern Asia. If the weather is cold enough, he may even be sleeping under an eider-down quilt invented in Scandinavia. On awakening he glances at the clock, a medieval European invention uses one potent Latin word in abbreviated form, rises in haste, and goes to the bathroom. If he stops to think about it, he must feel himself in the presence of a great American institution. He will have heard stories of both the quality and frequency of foreign plumbing and will know that in no other country does the average man perform his ablutions in the midst of such splendor. But the insidious foreign influence pursues him even here. Glass was invented by the ancient Egyptians, the use of glazed tiles for floors and walls in the Near East, porcelain in China, and the art of enameling on metal by Mediterranean artisans of the Bronze Age. Even his bathtub and toilet are but slightly modified copies of Roman originals. The only purely American contribution to the ensemble is the steam radiator. In his bathroom the American washes with soap invented by the ancient Gauls. Next, he cleans his teeth a subversive European practice that did not invade America until the latter part of the 18th century. He then shaves, a masochistic rite first developed by the heathen priests of ancient Egypt and Sumer. The process is made less of a penance by the fact that his razor is of steel, an iron carbon alloy discovered in either India or Turkestan. Lastly, he dries himself with a Turkish towel. Returning to the bedroom, the unconscious victim of un-American practices removes his clothes from a chair, invented in the Near East, and proceeds to dress. 
He puts on close-fitting tailored garments whose form derives from the skin clothing of the ancient nomads of the Asiatic Tepes and fastens them with buttons whose prototypes appeared in Europe at the close of the Stone Age. This costume is appropriate enough for outdoor exercise in cold climate, but is quite unsuited to American summers, steam-heated houses, and Pullmans. Nevertheless, foreign ideas and habits hold the unfortunate man in thrall even when common sense tells him that the authentically American costume of g-string and moccasins would be far more comfortable. He puts on his feet stiff coverings made from hide prepared by a process invented in ancient Egypt and cut to a pattern which can be traced back to ancient Greece, and makes sure they are properly polished, also a Greek idea. Lastly he ties around his neck a strip of bright colored cloth which is a vestigial survival of the should shawls worn by the 17th century Croats. He gives himself a final appraisal in the mirror, an old Mediterranean invention, and goes downstairs to breakfast. Here a whole new series of foreign things confronts him. His food and drink are placed before him in pottery vessels, the popular name of which China is sufficient evidence of their origin. His fork is a medieval Italian invention and his spoon a copy of a Roman original. He will usually begin the meal with coffee, an Abyssinian plant first discovered by the Arabs. The American is quite likely to need to dispel the morning after effects of overindulgence in fermented drinks, invented in the Near East, or distilled ones, invented by the alchemists of medieval Europe. Whereas the Arabs took their coffee straight, he will probably sweeten it with sugar, discovered in India, and dilute it with cream. Both the domestication of cattle and the technique of milking having originated in Asia Minor. If our patriot is old-fashioned enough to adhere to the so-called American breakfast, his coffee will be accompanied by an orange, domesticated in the Mediterranean region, a cantaloupe domesticated in Persia, or grapes, domesticated in Asia Minor. He will follow this with a bowl of cereal made from grain domesticated in the Near East and prepared by methods also invented there. From this he will go on to waffles, a Scandinavian invention, with plenty of butter, originally a Near East cosmetic. As a side dish he may have the egg of a bird domesticated in Southeastern Asia or strips of the flesh of an animal domesticated in the same region, which have been salted and smoked by a process invented in Northern Europe. Breakfast over, he places upon his head a molded piece of felt, invented by the nomads of Eastern Asia, if it look like rain, puts on outer shoes of rubber, discovered by the ancient Mexicans, and takes an umbrella, invented in India. He then sprints for his train the train, not the sprinting, being an English invention. At the station he pauses for a moment to buy a newspaper, paying for it with coins invented in ancient Lydia. Once on board he settles back to inhale the fumes of a cigarette invented in Mexico, or a cigar invented in Brazil. Meanwhile, he reads the news of the day, imprinted in characters invented in China. As he scans the latest editorial pointing out the dire results of our institutions accepting foreign ideas, he will not fail to thank a Hebrew god in an Indo-European language that he is 100% decimal system invented by the Greeks, American, from Americus Vespucci, Italian geographer.